Um, so I'll give it a second. All right, we are live. We have some people joining us. Good afternoon, or depending on where in the world you are, good morning, good evening. Um, thank you for being here with us this afternoon for the second installment of 4-4. So today I have with me Dominique Clayton, Raku Sile, and Mikhail Solomon, all founders of three really important initiatives in our landscape and arts and culture right now. Um, we are here for... 4-4, which is a new series that I just launched last week. Um, I am Niana Sophia Sandy, and this platform is really geared toward giving voice to the women in our space, moving and shaking in contemporary arts and culture. Each week, three guests gather to talk about their aspirations, their work, and their inspirations. This afternoon, I do want to take a moment and um, acknowledge that in this particular conversation, we are talking about people who are making strides in the space of having galleries, having platforms that commercially support art and artists. I do want to take a moment to acknowledge the forebears who have paved the way for us. Um, so those names that I would like to say are Augusta Savage, Aliea Walker, Suzanne Jackson, June Kelly, Linda Good Bryant, Karen Jenkins Johnson, and of course there are so many other names that I'm unable to share at this moment. And actually each of our panelists will share some names with you all as well. So uh, what we're gonna do, typically I'll read everyone's bio, introduce them, and then they'll share a bit um, about what they wanna share out in terms of what they're working on specifically. And then um, we'll come together and sort of reflect on the parts of the overlap. Good afternoon, Krista. Thank you for joining us again. And of course, if you all have any questions, please feel free to dump them in the Q&A segment, which you should be able to see toward the bottom of your screen. Um, of course, I expect a lively chat like we did last week. Also, take screenshots, tag us. It was real cute last week. I enjoyed it. So <laughs> please, please, please be sure to do that today. And so to begin, Dominique Clayton is a Los Angeles-based arts manager, writer, and founder of Dominique Gallery, a storefront and virtual exhibition space highlighting emerging artists of culture, I'm sorry, of color and women. After a 10-year career working in film and performing arts in New York, Los Angeles, and West Africa, Clayton shifted her focus to visual art and now focuses on enhancing diversity and representation in galleries, institutions, and publications. In laying the foundation for her gallery, Clayton recognized the limited options for minority artists and curators to enter into the industry and established an incubator to support emerging artists in every step, single-handedly editing portfolios, artist statements, bios, CVs, and proposals for applying for grants and residencies, pitching to press, and opening her doors for exhibitions and studio space. Clayton attributes her personal and nurturing approach to artist management to her family, ability to connect the right people and recognizing when a creative finally needs a yes instead of a no. In addition to Clayton, also works on as the manager in the director's office at the Broad Museum in LA, where she supports the museum's founding director in addition to the managing logistics for Broad Collection artists, programming and sponsorship partners, and other key museum constituents. Honoring her own passion for writing, Clayton also maintains a freelance writing practice and has been featured in the Washington Post, Cultured Magazine, Lala Magazine, Sugarcane Magazine, big ups to Melissa Gunfingers Fee, <laughs> um, Blavity 2190, and her own forthcoming Black Arts Diary. Clayton holds a master's degree in business design and arts leadership from SCAD, as well as a bachelor's degree from Columbia University. Thank you so much, Dominique, for being Thank here. You. So, take it away. <laughs> take it away. Um, well, um, just going back to what you said, you know, people that have laid the foundation, um, who were big inspiration to me. I think back my days living in Brooklyn, um, Lori Cumbo. Yes. Really yeah. special to me. Um, Mokata, which was right down the street from where I worked at, at the Brooklyn Academy of Music, was a place that was just very meaningful in my life. It's also where I met um, my husband. <laughs> and, um, you know, so that is just our spot. And I think I always like to say, you know, when I married him, you know, I, I married into art, you know, and he's an artist and just the whole, his family and the community that we were part of really cultivated that. Um, 
I also just think of when I made the transition back home to LA, which is my hometown, um, trying to figure out where to sort of plant my roots, because um, I did come from a film background and it made sense for me to just get right back in the Hollywood train, which I did. Um, but then I saw other people in LA who were doing sort of art cultivation um, and so they've left or they're doing other things now, but I think of there's a gallerist, uh, Erica Wall, who is just marvelous and now she's out in Massachusetts. Um, when I first came back, I know Michelle Papillon was here, she was doing her thing. Um, and other curators and arts leaders like Naima Keith. Um, I'm obsessed you know, with Naima. <laughs> yeah, so they you know, were really important to me um, and just being people I could relate to, I could reach out to that took my calls or my emails. Um, another wonderful artist and collector and mentor, Kathy Foley Mayer, um, was really influential in helping me decide to do the career change. Um, and of course, all the artists, you know, all the artists that I work with and continue to meet and grow. And, uh, but the point of this discussion is there weren't that many people. And so I kind of had to figure it out myself. Um, and LA was not natively an arts cultural capital. Um, I think that these people I've mentioned and, and others have made it that way today, but it, it really is, you know, Hollywood and celebrity centric. So to kind of turn the gaze, you know, into cultural product um, has really been a mission, not just for black artists and collectors, but for everyone, I think, in the art world in LA and it, it's happening. And there's finally some depth and sustainability here that I'm, I'm happy to be a part of. So. Awesome. Journey. Yeah, so do you want to talk more specifically about Dominique Gallery and... Yeah, so as I was saying, I, you know, I worked in Brooklyn, I worked in film and performance art and production, um, and I, I thought that was going to be my life. Um, and when I came back to Los Angeles, you know, we started a family, I realized that I just, the rat race of trying to you know, work in a film career, get productions together. I thought I wanted to make films and documentaries and write scripts, which is what I had studied and trained to do in school. Um, it just didn't suit my life at the time as a new mother, as a wife. Um, and I realized that all of those experiences were so temporary. You know, you put up a show, you do something, and then it's it's gone, you know, for film and television. But with art and just living with an artist and seeing the process every day, it really became something that I was, you know, just like spiritually attracted to. I just nurturing something from its inception all the way to its distribution was something that I was already doing as a mother and also as a friend and a wife. So it felt very natural for me to, to align myself with people who were also doing the same thing and then have the space and the time and the interaction to see it all the way through. And I felt like those relationships and those experiences were so much more real to me than when I was just like working on a film set or, you know, like you meet people, you work with them for a week and then you don't ever see them again. Um, so for me, it was kind of a healing that I needed to kind of go through because I felt all the pains of like rejection and stress and stuff of trying to make it in the film business which I don't discredit those people who do. It's just, I think I'm a Pisces. I'm very <laughs> like sensitive, you know, and I get really attached to things and it, um, it just wasn't my life anymore. So um, we had the studio space. That was my husband's uh, sculpture studio space. And then we converted a part of it into an exhibition space. And I thought, um, let's just try to get other people in here. I either just had a baby or I was about to have a baby. So I don't, I was just thinking all kinds of crazy, like, well, you know, I'm going to have a newborn. I don't have time to uh, be here every day. So why don't we, you know, have an artist in residence or have a, some kind of thing. So the idea behind the gallery just kind of came out of necessity. Like I, I had the space, I couldn't use it. So let's put somebody in there. Um, then when I, you know, after a few months, I had gone back to work, a job that I hated, um, but only because I just, I needed it. I needed the money, I needed the insurance, I'm raising a family. 
but every day that I was there, you know, I was obsessively kind of looking into some of the artists in LA and other things. And I think that was when I was building the idea, like, this is my new lane. This is my new life. This is what I'm meant to do. I just need to line up all the pieces. Um, and for me, you know, I'm kind of a nerd. I've always been an academic. I've always figured, okay, well, let me study who did it first and then do that. Or let me read these books and let me figure it out and we'll do that. You know, I enrolled in a school program with a newborn. I'm like reading books, nursing in the middle of the night, like just trying to piece it all together. Like, where am I going to get the money? Where am I going to get the space? How am I going to build it out? Um, and I just, I feel like it was just a lot of divine intervention that came mm -hmm. where, you know, um, I got some chunk of money here. I got this window of advertising here or a marketing person or PR, somebody would just come into my life and have these conversations. And so they were just little reminders, like you're on the right track. Um, then when I finally made the decision to cut the strings off of one career, which I think a lot of people don't talk about when you're starting a business, you know, where are you getting the money from? Or like, are you leaving something behind to do something new? And so that was something I had struggled with because it just, as a mother of three children, doesn't make sense for me to quit a great job and to go out on a limb and do something that I've never done before and think that I could support myself and my family and the artists. Um, so it was crazy. In retrospect, I think about, you know, what I was going through at the time, which was a, probably a combination of depression from the job I hated, you know, postpartum, like I just, I just had baby, I had two other ones, you know, just living in the, this chaotic environment but out of that I think I just saw this like light like if I just stay on the course I'm gonna you know live the life that I want and you know I could safely say almost five years later that's that's where I am um and it, it was not pretty it was there was a lot of times where I just questioned everything even the day of the first show I ever had in the space everything that could go wrong did, you know, from a flood in the bathroom to the light fixture breaking, the paint on the outside not drying, like it was just, you know, it was a joke. And I, you know, a lot of it was like, what am I doing? This looks ridiculous. I'm not doing my artists justice. I'm not, you know, stepping out on a good foot. But each day that I would go in there after that show and just looked at the art on the walls and the space, knowing that I did this, I provided the space for somebody. People can walk by and look at it. That was all I needed, you know, and I obviously I didn't make any money from that show and from other things I did. I actually lost a lot of money, but I knew that the physical space that I had intentionally planned out was, was, you know, the step in the direction for me to, to make my contribution to the world, to the arts world and to be an example also to my children that if you have an idea for something and if it sounds crazy to everybody else but you really stick with it, it you can manifest it it will be there and when i put the vinyl tape on the wall that had my name dominique gallery you know my kids are just like oh my god where did you get that how did you do that you know and that was the part that made me realize okay this is what it's for this is so that when my daughters in 20 years are looking through art history books you know, my name is there, your name is there, other people, you know, like they can see the stories and the spaces and the history that we're like currently creating because I don't recall reading anything like this when I was in college or even in graduate school learning about arts management. I didn't learn about any black art spaces. Um, a few black artists maybe that I had to research, but there was no model that I could really study, honor and replicate. And that's, I feel like, why I do what I do. Um, that's really the main purpose uh, is, is legacy. And hopefully some, some generational wealth for the artists and for the community. Um, but that takes time. You know, I didn't go in this thinking I'd be a millionaire. I thought I was just doing something um, beautiful. And that's, I think, invaluable. Wow, thank you so much. That was really great. Um, so next, we will introduce Rakeb Sile. She's the founder 
and director of Addis Fine Art, a pioneering gallery in Addis Ababa. So really shout out to Addis, to uh, Raku, because you are joining us from Addis. So it's what, eight o'clock at night, right? Eight o'clock, yes. Um, so Addis Fine Art is a pioneering gallery based in Addis Ababa in London, focused on highlighting modern and contemporary fine art from the Horn of Africa and its diaspora. Listed as one of 27 most important young galleries in the world, Addis Fine Art has become one of the leading international galleries from Africa, facilitating critical engagement with the local and mainstream art markets, championing an underrepresented yet rich space in modern and contemporary fine art. The very first local space and international platform based in Ethiopia, the gallery maintains an exciting exhibition program showcasing leading and emerging artists across its Addis Ababa and London spaces, whilst also exhibiting at art fairs around the world. So, uh, Raku, take it away. First of all, um, thank you very much uh, for inviting me onto this amazing panel. So I'm very delighted to be here. Um, if uh, the power goes off and my screen goes black, please don't be alarmed. <laughs> the, what we have to deal with in <laughs> Ethiopia. Um, but just, yeah, going back to uh, women that have inspired me um, to at least collect, because I, I started off as a collector. I really wasn't part of the art, um, uh, you know, ecosystem. You know, I came, I came at, into art as a collector to begin with. And um, I really, the reason why I did that is because I really wanted to see things that I remembered growing up with uh, around me. You know, I, I grew up partly in Ethiopia and partly in the UK. And, you know, as I grew up, um, you know, got a job and got my first house or whatever, I, I wanted things that reminded me of my culture and the things that I remember growing up and I honestly could not find. So, you know, when I went to, I would go back to Ethiopia to kind of rediscover things, to go see family, and I would end up in studios mostly, but there were two incredible women that I remember um, that had galleries, and um, one of them is still around actually, but I just want to mention them. Onjit Siyum um, has had a gallery in Addis called Asni Gallery for over 20 years, and I remember, you know, she did some incredible exhibitions that completely blew my mind. Um, uh, you know, when I was uh, just exploring art for myself. Um, also, um, Mascara Masaged is another name that maybe some people will know. She works very closely with an artist called Elia Sime. Um, she's a curator. She, she didn't actually have a space, but she would use these um, kind of derelict places and the, the international um, cultural institutes to put on these incredible shows. And I remember the first show I ever saw of Elia Sime just blew my mind. He had like, you know, ants made out of wire just coming up the wall. Um, I mean, it was, it just blew my mind, but this was, you know, uh, maybe 15 years ago. So I, you know, those two women definitely uh, have been inspiring and I, and I look back now and certainly, uh, you know, they are, uh, they definitely opened the way for, for me and Masai to, to have at this fine art really in, in, in a place where a gallery infrastructure is really not there. Um, so yeah, just uh, to mention those two. Yeah, so I just find that really um, is came about because you know it's just an for me it was a, a it was an identity thing. I wanted to see uh, art from my own place to that reflects me uh, more in the mainstream, and I just couldn't really figure out why it wasn't there. But also, I, I came at it as a collector that I really didn't understand myself what I was collecting. So you know, I had all the stuff that I that I had bought, but I didn't really know what it was, you know, what, why is it important? Who have I collected? Um, what's the art history behind this? And so I really had to go on a journey of discovery for myself um, to really educate myself as to what it is that I wanted to see. And this is what led me to find Masai who actually lived in LA, Dominique. Um, he lived mm -hmm. in LA for I think 40 years. I think a long time. <laughs> so I, you know, I took a sabbatical from my job and um, I did lots of research beforehand and, and I, and I just, I just came to LA to find him. And I was like, what are you doing? What's going on? Can you teach me about some of these things that I, I just couldn't find um, information on, you know, it's not written uh, anywhere. Um, or if it is written, it's in another language that I can't access. So there was a whole bunch of, um, 
it was more of a, a, a discovery for myself to begin with. So that just, that, that act of me trying to figure out what I was doing for myself kind of has led, and this was eight years ago, that has led to so many things kind of falling into place that has led Masai and I to now become partners um, and to open Addis Fine Art four years ago. Um, and to just get to where we, where we are today, which is really, um, sometimes when I look back on it, quite awe-inspiring even for myself, because it really just happened. It, it's just like it was an idea that just snowballed out of control, really. Mm-hmm. Um, because we just could not have envisaged how far we would have gotten when we started. It was just one thing at, at led to another. You know, we did one curatorial project, then we did one, we had one artist that we were working with. And then we thought, oh gosh, you, we, when we hit a dead end, we were like, okay, well, maybe we need to have a space. So where should we have the space? Should it be in LA or London or it could have been anywhere. Um, but I think the decision, I think the key and the pivotal decision that we made to do something crazy, as Dominic was saying, and to open a gallery in a place that where there was no market, really. And there was, I mean, we didn't, four years ago, Ethiopia didn't even have functioning internet. So like, it was such a crazy place to, to try and do what we were thinking of doing. But we thought that um, at least for authenticity and also for, 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 the, for the ability just to be so close to the artists that we wanted to support. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and for the ability to also be with the, with the new collectors or the, co- the collectors to be, if you like, to be there with them, to support them through this journey of discovery for themselves as well. Because I think local collectors are just so key uh, for African art, at least, you know, on the continent, because without them it just becomes like an export model you know you're here or you're in london wherever you're just exporting culture and that is really dangerous because we really need our own people to value just to value the culture and to put where to put their money where the culture is i would say because like otherwise one they'll just miss out you know it will be kind of like the chinese model where the Chinese are having to buy back stuff like at a hundred times the price because now they just, now they have money, but they just, but it's kind of too late. Um, so we just really felt like it was the harder thing to do, but we thought it was the right thing to do. And actually it kind of made us this unique, um, gallery where we could really, um, just create a space for ourselves, you know, with the fairs and, um, and, and I think, also having the London, we, all, we, we never had an actual gallery space because the, the gallery um, in Ethiopia was really the heart of the, of the whole project. It's, we had a project space that we shared with another gallery. So, you know, it just allowed us to just still be accessible to um, international collectors that wanted to get to know us. So it was really like we had to do both things at the same time. Because just being a local space, I don't think would have worked. It, we would have just not been able to survive, if I'm honest with you. And if we just if we if we were had just opened in London or LA, I think that also we would have lost that unique authenticity that we for us was really is really important. Uh, because it's we we also feel it's not just about the individual artist per se. For us, it's about the collective art history because a place like Ethiopia, it's such an old place. I mean, you know, people are talking about African art like it's like this new kind of, you know, young and all that. Fine, but it's not. Like Ethiopia is one of the oldest countries in the world actually. So the, the art history is so deep. And when when people are approaching African art right now, um, it's it's a little bit shallow. And I think there there needs to be when I say shallow, I mean, it's like, you know, they, they think it's one place and actually Africa is a multiplicity of places. And, you know, you have to have kind of regional experts or regional spaces, institute, whatever shape they take actually doesn't really matter in a way that can, that can allow that discourse to take place and, and can allow people who want to go deep into the art history to go deep into it. And, and these are the, some of the, things that we wanted to tackle when we started uh, at this fine arts. I mean, it was a tall, I mean, it is a tall order. It still is a tall order, if I'm honest, like for a small gallery, young gallery to kind of try to do all these things, but it just has to be done. And 
you know, we've just taken it upon ourselves to do it. It's not easy. And um, Dominique, just to um, echo some of the things you said about motherhood, <laughs> um, I mean, I always, when I speak to women, I always say I have three kids because <laughs> AFA, Addis Art is kind of my third child. You know, my, my son is five, Addis Art is four, and I have a three-year-old daughter. So in a way, I always feel like I'm a mother of three because it was, you know, we, I kind of birthed it at the same time as I was also, you know, having uh, my family and yeah, and just kind of nurturing uh, both a business and um, children in a way is a very similar. I I found anyway very similar skills that you need and it and it and it takes um, not just your kind of uh, knowledge, but it just it takes so much more. It takes so much passion, so much of your heart to get it to the next level. So. Yeah, I always say I'm a, I'm a mom of three. <laughs> <laughs> that was really awesome. Thank you so much for that. Uh, so next we'll be hearing from Mikhail Solomon. Mikhail Solomon was born and raised in Miami, Florida and is of Caribbean heritage. Her parents are from the islands of St. Kitts and Nevis. She is a graduate of Florida International University's graduate program in architecture and completed her undergraduate degree in theater arts at the University of South Florida. With her varied and professional experience comes many years of developmental work in design, education, arts advocacy, and community development. In 2013, Mikhail founded and currently serves as the director of PRISM Art Fair, a cutting edge art fair that expands the spectrum of exhibiting international artists from the global African diaspora and emerging markets during Art Basel Miami Beach. PRISM's mission is to exhibit a diverse roster of artists whose works reflect global trends in contemporary art through a series of cultural events which culminates in our annual curated fair. PRISM's roster includes artists from the Caribbean, the United States and Africa. Mikhail's varied professional background has instilled a great capacity for leadership and her continued service to the greater Miami community through the arts. Her hope is to help strengthen Miami's cultural offerings and to participate in the creation of more creative opportunities for its residents. Thank you so much again, Mikhail, for joining us. And please go ahead. Thank you so much for uh, putting together this um, panel. Um, it's been great just to listen to um, the experiences of both Dominique and Rakeb um, so far. Um, um, as you mentioned, um, I come from an architectural background. So originally I thought I was going to be an architect um, after having gone to school for theater. Um, so I sort of dabbled quite a bit um, in a number of different um, creative endeavors before I decided to land where, where I'm at now. Um, and um, I found that architecture was essentially the, the springboard for a lot of the things um, that I decided to do subsequently. Um, and um, as we were talking about different, I guess, forerunners and people who were of influence to us initially, um, when I was in architecture school, I was inspired by a woman named Zaha Hadid, who unfortunately passed. Um, Maybe three years ago now, and she was actually a resident of Miami. She was here because she was working on um, a project that's almost complete now in downtown Miami. Um, so she was originally my when, when I was working in that space. She was the like original inspiration for me creative, cre creatively. Um, and uh, I actually graduated from architecture school um, around the recession time back in two thousand and eight. So a lot of, a lot of um, I guess, new people, young folks who were um, trying to find work in architecture couldn't find any. Um, so um, I, I, I was at the time working at a firm, but they had to unfortunately offload some of their labor. <laughs> um, and I um, was sort of left out in the wind trying to figure out what I was going to do next. And um, I essentially um, kind of, interned and worked for a number of people and started working in arts project on arts projects here in Miami um, and started doing research on what was happening here in the cultural landscape. Um, and uh, there were projects like, you know, Diaspora Vibe, uh, which is run by um, Rosie Gordon Wallace um, and has a focus on- um, I'm sorry, we got to big up Rosie real quick. Yeah, Matt Rosie is doing- yeah. Also, wait, I, I told her I was going to say this. I completely forgot. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. 
I'm, I'm, I'll be done in like 30 seconds. Oh, so sure. Rosie is actually doing something really important today. Um, they're actually raising funds to do food deliveries to artists. Um, I'm going to tell you what that's called in a few minutes, but I think that's important for us to mention. Sorry, Mikhail, please continue. No worries. No worries. Um, so yeah, so Rosie, uh, who was um, uh, like one of the original folks here in Miami that was working with artists specifically from the Caribbean. Um, I'm from the Caribbean, so that, you know, like my my initial interest was learning more about artists and create creative practice that emanates from that space. Um, I'm from St. Kitts and like there's rarely ever any conversation, unfortunately, about any art that comes, unless it's like vernacular. Um, from St. Kitts, with the exception of like, um, there's an, a photographer named Terry Body. He's from Nevis, and he does great work. Um, but um, like my 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 instinct, my initial instinct, especially after having worked with projects here in Miami and sort of floating around to all the different art fairs that we do have here, I was like, wait a minute, I don't I don't see I don't see us in any of this. Um, and if I do see it, I do I see like maybe modicum pieces of it. Um, and, uh, and so in 20, I think it was 2013 after, um, still not being able to find any work in architecture, um, I said to myself, well, maybe I should just start a project. And, uh, I, I founded the fair in 2013, um, uh, and worked after listening to a number of conversations, um, a lot of artists even in Miami had the similar sentiment that they, they go to a lot of these larger art fairs and don't see themselves and they don't they themselves are not participating in them and in many ways um this like behemoth that comes to miami every year shows international artists but doesn't include miami artists in that space um so um my thought was that well let's just like put our heads together and figure out how to do something here that can be in impactful for folks that are that are based here in miami and we kind of have a mandate that we must have at least 25% of our fair has to be um, representative of artists from Miami. Um, and uh, we started in 2013 with 25 individual artists um, and worked with individual artists until about 2017 when we started working and in inviting galleries um, to participate. And for me, it was really important for me to invite galleries that were where the where the proprietors themselves were of African descent, um, because you don't see that often. Um, and if you do go to large affairs, there might be one or two um, um, proprietors, or maybe three um, proprietors at large affairs. But for me, it was it was really important to use Prism as an opportunity to uh, discuss the fact that there's been plenty of gallery proprietors that have sort of been left out of art history. Um, like you have your Peg Alstons and your, your Bill Hodges, all these folks have been like literally um, laying the foundation but have been left out of, out, out of um, the uh, like larger, I guess, global arts canon for, for a while. So I, I myself didn't necessarily have a, a background in art history, but I, I was thankful that when people learned what I was trying to do, they were very, very, um, uh liberal with 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 their knowledge and they were um, willing to share some of the history with me so that i can then be a, a, a bet a good steward of it um a lot of friends and scholarship um we have we actually have wonderful writers and curators based here in miami um from the university of miami um there's a um, fantastic uh her name is patricia saunders and she is a Caribbean literature um, scholar at the University of Miami. Um, and Erica James, who just recently came here, but she used to be the, she's the founding director of um, the National Gallery of the Bahamas. Um, she's a, a professor at University of Miami as well. So like there's just, there was a very, a, a various number of people here locally with whom I had several conversations about what was missing, what need, where, where the gaps needed to be filled, um, and I, I always try to keep that in mind when I'm putting these, these fairs together. Um, and we've, we like recently we've had, um, galleries like Richard Beaver's gallery that's based in New York. 
Um, we've had September Gray, which is based in Atlanta. Um, we've had Amy Morton. Amy Morton's based in Washington, D.C. and represents um, Amber Robles Gordon and Keisha Bruce. Um, Garbo Hearn, who's essentially had a career that spans, I want, I want to say about maybe 25, 30 years. Um, uh, and she's based in Little Rock, Little Rock Arkansas. Um, so we, we've been able to fill up a space with people who have been an essential part of, of the, the Black conversation around the arts for a really long time. And, um, and that's like a, 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 a thing that I want to continue to do. Um, um, and I, I really appreciate the artists who have entrusted me with, um, with their, with their talents to, to present this to, to the, to the world, essentially. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, something that I'm hearing also, I did find the name of the thing that, uh, Rosie is doing today. So it is mm -hmm. called Farms to Studios. Um, you can get more information about that at www dvcai.org forward slash artist relief. Um, so they are actually partnering with Fountainhead as well as Miami Dade County on that. So please check that out and support if you can. So that actually leads me into what I was going to say. Um, what I what I'm hearing from each of you, and it's interesting because I thought about like, oh, I'll put these three together. And then of <laughs> course, all of these other things are sort of popping up as we have these conversation as we have this conversation together. So I'm I'm thinking about locality. I'm thinking about the ways that each of you are kind of bringing your cities with you. And in your case, uh, Raku, your country. Um, in your case, Mikhail, with thinking about diaspora holistically. And um, this is something that I think I said last week. I find myself saying this a lot. Just this idea that uh, when you're from New York or you're from like DC or maybe even Chicago, LA to maybe a slightly lesser extent, London, these places, this idea of diaspora is very clear to you. Um, and if you don't live in those places, it's maybe not such an easy idea to grasp and it's not an easy idea to see. So I think something that's important about what each of you are doing, you are doing that, but you're also putting your cities within the very context of the work that you're doing and actually bringing just that embodiment of culture to those spaces. And I wonder, obviously, each of you have thought about that individually, but I wonder about what you think that might do in the larger scheme of things mm -hmm. in this space, in this moment in particular. Um, where, you know, as you just said, when you were speaking, Raku, that, you know, Ethiopia didn't necessarily have fully working internet, you said four years ago. Yeah. So I think, I think it's an it's interesting, year, <laughs> what's that? <laughs> you have done this last year. Like I couldn't have been on this call with you even as, as you know, so there's so many different, you know, the the issues that we experience here um, for you know doing what we're trying to do it, it they're kind of countless things that are completely unexplainable to you guys because you just would never imagine you know we're talking about power mm -hmm. outages internet was really not functional properly until maybe i would say six months ago or something you know um so yeah it's 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 a difficult place to to create what we're trying to do. But I think the diaspora is really important for us because a place like Ethiopia, and I think any, anywhere um, in Africa, I would say there's been waves of migration. You know, we've had waves and waves of migration. I, I'm a migrant. I left in the in the 90s. Masai's a migrant. He left in the 80s, you know, so and it's the same for our artists and our art historians and people who understand our culture. They've left the country and settled pretty much all over the world. I mean, we have an artist that we work with who, who lives in Guadeloupe, you know, um, Israel, um, Germany, US, you know, so, but these, all of these stories are really important if you're trying to kind of create um, kind of a holistic vision of the art history of a region, yeah. because all of these people have a connection culturally to the place, but actually, Ethiopia is a little bit more um, interesting than that because we we have an art school here that's been here since the 50s. 
So oh, wow. we didn't do this on purpose, but actually the artists, even in the diaspora that we picked out and um, a majority of them have a connection to the art school. They went to the art school, they did their BFA and then they migrated. You know, there's, there's a link to, the, to this incredible art school that we even, even we didn't know and we're discovering more and more. So it's, it's these links um, that are really important to discover. And, you know, it, it needs, you know, we have to stitch them all together so that we can understand what contemporary culture means for certain regions. And, it, and, and it's dispersed, you know, it's not just in Ethiopia, you know, you, you now with, the, with, with, with people leaving, migrating and, and being influenced by different cu other cultures and so on, all of these things matter and they, and they make a difference. And even with the artists that we work with that were practically raised, like, you know, Tariku was practically raised in, in, in the US. I mean, he's an American artist, but there are, li there are little threads of his uh, creative consciousness that still goes back to where he comes from and his experience as a, as a immigrant, as, as, as somebody that's not in their natural state or place. So all of these, all of these conversations, all of these kind of ideas are important. I'm not sure if I'm answering your question, however, <laughs> but that's how I'm thinking about the diaspora. You know, when I say diaspora, I, I, I'm always linking it back to this um, art history that we're trying to discover just by doing what we're doing because it's unwritten and we're kind of figuring it out and we're writing it as we go. And, and potentially, you know, the, the, kind of the grand vision for the gallery is that we, we can, you know, we can fashion some sort of, we can leave behind um, a narrative that really would not have been there if we, if we hadn't bothered to kind of figure it out and piece it together. Awesome. Uh, <laughs> I would say that, I mean, most of, I, I would say most of the artists that, um, we work with, whether they be from the continent or from the Caribbean, they've all, whether it be because they, they're seeking new opportunities, or I mean, that's why my parents came here. You know, my parents left the Caribbean for, for new opportunities. But many, many of the artists who are, who are originally from the Caribbean have decided to migrate to either New York or, you know, Miami. And even, even that that conversation around how their migration to the United States is, is an interesting one and oftentimes their work is, is, um, is an extension of that migratory pattern um, or is a conversation around that migratory pattern. Um, so I, I think it's so interesting like even in my, my own personal travels and going to several places on the continent and, um, and I remember my first time in Lagos and I was like, oh, this is where, as a Caribbean person, I was like, oh, this is where we get it from. Like, <laughs> like I was like, th like nothing about it felt foreign to me. Um, it like the cacophony of sounds, the colors, the food, the smells, everything was very much so a part of who I was, even though I'd never been there before. And mm -hmm. I think I felt, I felt that way in different ways because like, like Raku mentioned, like the content is a big place and it's not a monolith, the cultural, footprints and experiences in each place are very different but it's I, I just always found that that was so interesting that even though I was in unique places on the continent I still felt uh, an affinity with each place in a different way and um and and I think I, I feel the same way when I look at the work of artists from these various places whether you be from the Caribbean or whether you be from the continent I still feel that they're all connected in some way, whether that be through the use of materials, whether that be the use of color, whether it's the narrative that ties it together. Um, you can always find where we, even though we're separated by ge geography and experiences, where we are still so much a part of each other. I don't know if that answers your question, but yeah. Honestly, <laughs> I, I was like, well, sorry. No yeah. <laughs> Um, well, I'll add to that. Los Angeles is really complicated. Um, I, as a native, you know, I feel like black cultural identity in Los Angeles is just mm. kind of all over the place. Um, to be honest, a lot of it has to do with just economics, segregation within, you know, the city. 
Um, and so with that comes the stereotypes and sort of the access that other neighborhoods don't have. And growing up, you know, it was either like, okay, you're on the south side of LA or on the east side, you know, this is where black neighborhoods are, this is what black people do, this is where you go to get these black things, and then you work or maybe go to school or you do something else in another part of town, and people just go back and forth like that. I feel like only recently, now that there have been significant improvements to certain neighborhoods, whether that's directed by black people or others, the point, it, the changes exist. Um, and so now we're, you know, we're seeing more gatherings and more appreciation within Black localities, right? So, you know, Crenshaw, Limerick Park, um, Mid City, our, Englewood are now places where people are happy to, to hang out and to stay and to sort of patronize. Um, and I think that that's helped really with bringing an arts community back together because you know, there, there always was one, you know, like in Limerick Park and Crenshaw, there was always, you know, black cultural capitals. And even as a child, I'm, my mom would take me, go out of her way to bring me to see like African dance performances and all kinds of things that were not necessarily part of mainstream city life. Um, I don't recall going to an art gallery or even a museum unless it was a school trip, but even still it was like nothing black related, you know, it was just, a regular natural history museum. So that's probably why at the age of 17, I was like, I'm leaving LA, I need to go find culture. <laughs> and I, let, I went to school in New York and I did all that there. But I feel like having been in New York and also living and studying in West Africa, I almost felt like it was a duty to come back home and to like find and connect all those dots. Because I'm like, here I live in this wonderfully rich city. And the same thing kind of happened with like, I always go back to the Hollywood model, like black actors and theater and film and television used to be very few and far between. And I, my sister, my older sister, who's an actress, always would complain like, oh, there's not enough roles, not enough parts, there's not enough whatever. And then little by little, you started seeing more like black production companies, filmmakers, directors, just doing their own thing. Um, and the same thing I feel like is happening now in sort of the arts. There is an arts community in LA, artists, all know each other, they support each other, they hang out with each other, um, and that it's growing. And it's funny because a lot of those people aren't even from LA mm. per se, but they, they've made it their home. And um, so I can think like every time I go to an opening or any kind of event, it's, you know, the same people are there to celebrate each other. It doesn't feel like this very divisive kind of situation. It actually feels like a family, a community, and, you know, I forgot to mention before, like Karan Davis and Underground Museum, like all these places, they remind me of like being back in Brooklyn, you know, when Weeksville and Mokata were like really taking off the ground and now they've become really important institutions. Um, I feel like we're just now seeing the birth of that kind of, you know, institutional building in LA. And which is also probably, you know, why I feel it's important to, to kind of maintain my space and to, to really be involved in that because with economics and real estate and physical space, we could lose it. And LA is already so spread out. Mm -hmm. So um, it's, I, I feel like it's for the permanence and for like the real community to exist. Um, we have to be there because LA is so far too from New York and Miami and other places. So when you talk about the diaspora, like we're physically so far removed from all other black cultural communities that it's even more important for us to to sort of know each other, be each other. I mean, the only other city that has a significant community is, you know, if you go up north to San Francisco, Oakland, but even still, there's not even a lot of cross community organizing and, and we're so close. So if we can't even do that, like, within the same state you know we really need to at least focus on what's happening on the city level um and but also i mean encourage people to leave and come back but it's just it's hard and especially now with traveling um it's you know we got to stay put and um but yeah la is it's interesting <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so we have a question from Lauren Harris that I think is really a good next place for us to go. Um, so she says, here in Atlanta, specifically at the Atlanta University Center, Spelman Morehouse, Clark Atlanta, 
We have a grant funded program that cultivates and educates young black men and women in art history and curatorial studies. We have found it's necessary to partner and collaborate with art and cultural spaces from all over, as well as engage black art professionals in the art industry. Aside from being leaders in your spaces, how do you feel that you are reaching back and creating a pipeline for more of us to enter the art world? This is a, should I take this? Do it. <laughs> uh, this is an, an, a really important question actually, and um, something that is, uh, Masai and I have been thinking about literally since the first day we opened our commercial gallery because in a place like Ethiopia there is no ecosystem at all look so there's no gallery system there's no institutional system the only really thing that we have is we have this amazing art school that's just been doing what it can for decades and it's um, able to turn out well-trained artists, but they come out and there's absolutely nothing mm -hmm. uh, for them to do. So the, the, one of the biggest things that we um, grappled with to begin with was, you know, are we going to open a commercial gallery first or are we gonna open an institution first? Like that was just the real, there was a tension there because in a way like both are needed, but we, as a, as a unit, we don't have the capacity to do everything kind of simultaneously. Mm -hmm. So, it felt like, and because just because I, I come from corporate, it felt like it was the easier thing to do to just start something commercial. And also just to, we also felt that it was important to have that commercial um, space because you have to prove the business case. These artists are not less than anything. It's just, they don't have any platform. So it's, you know, to be able to go out onto the global market and say, actually guys, this is, this is underrepresented, it's underpriced. You know, the business case had to be also proven and we didn't um, want it to just be kind of charitable. You know, that's the kind of models sometimes that just are quite um, regressive where you say, oh, you know, the, the artists need charity. Actually, they don't, they're accomplished. Mm -hmm. They need platforms. So we, we decided to do the gallery first, but. I, actually since this whole covid thing happened and we're now we're on lockdown we can't do anything our ga both galleries are closed our programs are you know we have to postpone them for the commercial space we really managed to kind of uh, consolidate our plan our, our phase two which is to see if we can set up a, a kind of an institutional an institutional face or an institutional brand here in ethiopia because we we have to do that um not just for the artists, but also for curators. We don't have any curatorial programs here, not even at the art school. Uh, we need photography school. We don't, you know, most, all of the ph photographers that we uh, represent are self-trained or they've had workshops here and there, or they've had to travel to get training. Um, we need a framing school, you know, everything, you know, you can think of needs to be done here. And, um, and so that's our phase two. Like we have to create a, a nonprofit side of the of the gallery because even now, if I'm honest, um, in Addis, our Addis Gallery kind of, you know, it 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 functions like a social enterprise. You know, we have to do a number of things that are nonprofit oriented because we just have to be there. You know, we have to fill so many gaps. So I think that it's it's important that uh, that question was asked because I think these are there's so many gaps to fill and I just think lo lots more people need to kind of come into the space to to support and to fill um, a multitude of gaps and when there aren't um, and if there's capacity we, we just have to do them ourselves I think mm -hmm. and, and I think that will go the, I mean I think all of the ladies on the, pla on the panel will agree that they they have to fill up so many more shoes then they really um <laughs> ought to <laughs> I, I can also add to um to what what Rakib was saying um so with prism prism actually is it's like a, a dual company structure we have a for profit for profit and non-profit and that non-profit does things like educationally and so like our panel discussions and our fellowship where we invite young people who are interested in art, arts administration um, or have an interest in like 
curatorial practice eventually will come and work with us and just kind of like see how the sausage is made um, <laughs> for a couple of months. And um, they help me organize things. They they work with one our board one of our board members is very much so instrumental in organizing them and their expectations around the experience that they want to have and get from um, the time that they are with us. Um, so it's something that we've been piloting, piloting for the last two years to figure out what people who are learning need in order to feel as though it is a, um, a fruitful uh, experience for them. And like after talking to them and like just like sort of um, understanding what they are may be getting and what, what they might not be getting, we, we're, we're sort of iterating that experience so that we can potentially even bring on other consultants who, who know how, who understand um, what the management of the uh, expectations of youth in this space are. Um, and I, I, I agree with, I think I've spoken to Lauren about this before. Um, like there has to be, and I, and I really applaud that, that she's actually working with folks in Atlanta to do this. But in Miami, there's, like, there's literally very few spaces that um, have this focus, that have a focus on the diaspora and you can actually learn about artists from our space through through an art an art institution practice uh, or arts institution platform. So we're we're trying to do that, and um, and so yeah, that that's that's what we're doing on our side. Yeah, I mean it's it, it's tough. I've had interns, you know, and I've had other type of you know arrangements where someone has helped me or shadowed me. I'm also myself a lifelong learner because, you know, if if there's no template for me to follow, like I'm kind of learning as I go, which, you know, even in my other jobs and other stuff I do, I take knowledge and experience from that and apply it to what I'm doing because it's, it's not always the same. I can't, I don't have the same set of issues that maybe a white gallery in Hollywood might have, you know, like there's just a completely different step. So you have to adapt. Um, also, I mean, it, it, arts education, it, it has to really start from there too, because I've dealt with a lot of artists who are fresh out of MFA programs who didn't learn really anything about managing their practice. They, they've learned how to like work further in their in the genre of art, but not even like what conversations to have to sort of advocate for themselves. So, I mean, that, I think that's a failure within arts master's programs that are you know, you, you want to master your craft, but you also need to master how you can navigate the business side of the art world. So if anything, I, I, I feel like there should always, almost be like postgraduate or some other type of opportunities for those who do the MFA route, um, because it makes it challenging for me to, tr to try to like work with an artist, but then also be teaching them at the same time and convincing them to try these different things because they don't even know what the value or the risk of it is because no one has told them that in the same way that you know even just the different types of jobs that exist um it's not really made public like it's not shared so i know that just in my work with the museum programs like the diversity apprenticeship program which is specifically to train you know minority art handlers and and museum preparators like who would have thought that's a thing but it, it it is important and it's a very small community um and there are hardly any people of color who are doing that on an institutional level so you know even just meeting those students or workers and, and seeing where they fall where they end up whether it's a museum or a gallery or an art fair you know as installers like for me to track those people and to kind of keep them in my back pocket so like if I'm ever going to do a fair or a bigger event I know that this is the group of people that I would like to support or hire or um, tell another gallery or fair to utilize so it's all about info sharing I really I think that we need to be you know we're not competitors right we're supporters of each other so I feel like as I learn stuff I always you know impart it on somebody else especially if it's a useful skill and I wish you know I know Lauren and I know what she does and I know other people I feel like we need to have some kind of a, a database or some kind of system in place where we can quickly disseminate that information because that's how 
other businesses of other backgrounds get stuff done. They hook up family, they hook up friends, partners or whatever, and it's all very insular. So, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's bad when we're cut out of it, but if we can do that same thing and keep folding in our partners, our family, our friends, our community, then it'll, it only will work out for us. It's just, we have to be willing and able to do that um, and see it all the way through. So who's going to start it? Are we going to start it? Is that the outgrowth of this conversation? <laughs> the info. I mean, even just, yeah, like when someone has a show or, you know, the thing, you know, reaching out to somebody, like, how can I promote this? Or how can I share this? Or do you need help with this? Or are you, is this going to tour? Or, you know, anything. Or if you see a relationship between two artists or someone else, you know, to throw some names in the pot. Or like right now I'm trying to open up my space to have more new curators get you know cut their teeth with trying to put a show together because we're at quarantine i'm doing all these online programs why not call some people i know who are who want to be curators and see if they want to put something together it's a low risk situation but it also helps them to to try something and to you know to impart that vision um which again isn't an opportunity that a lot of galleries would give to somebody else you know especially if they don't know them so i think trust and generosity is is really the way to go and also if some if a partnership or something doesn't work out like being instead of just cutting people off and being like i don't mess with them anymore it's like maybe give them the feedback <laughs> that they need so that they aren't being talked about by everybody you know like hey girl i think you should try to communicate this way or you should do this because you're not gonna go far <laughs> if you don't you know like so those are the kinds of things, I mean, it's, we're asking to do so much, right? Like as women, like help, nurture, educate, um, raise, be, like it's, but it's just part of, I feel like what we have to do. Um, exactly. Awesome. Um, all right, Lauren, I hope you're happy with those answers. Um, <laughs> we call you. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's a little after two. Are you all okay with continuing or? Yeah. 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 Cool. So we have six more questions here. Um, I'm just going to kind of take a look and see if there's anything that um, feels more like a next step than just going in the chronological order. Um, mm. So Roberta has asked, as we are faced with COVID-19, which has pivoted our practices to the more virtual landscape? What is the future of curation, display of artwork, and galleries? Given that our society has changed forever in terms of how we experience and consume cultural experiences and information, what would be the new gallery space or festival, art festival? What would that look like to you? I mean, I think, I mean, I'm most, from what I've noticed so far, um, most, and we, it's something we we're planning on doing as well. Is um, I would say a lot of a lot of large fairs um, have migrated um, their physical platforms to the virtual space, which um, might be beneficial in that you're you're able to make touch points with a more international com uh, com community versus you know everybody having to fly into a location mm -hmm. um, to experience the fair. The, the one drawback of that is that, you know, art is something that you've got to experience in person um, to really, you know, really understand its inner workings and really understand its texture. Um, so I know, I understand too that some folks are even getting into augmented reality um, mm -hmm. where, you know, you can, you can kind of see the work online, but in the round so that it doesn't necessarily, the virtual space doesn't flatten a piece. You can actually see it in a more in a more three-dimensional sort of way um, I, I I think I think having things live in the virtual space does give more opportunities for if you're in, on the commercial end of things for you know sales and getting more eyes on on the on the work itself but what I would say is that the that the disadvantage of it is, is that you don't necessarily get to um, connect with your network 
I mean, I find that events and you know, fairs are just such a great way for you to connect with people physically. And we're, I think we're creatures of connection. We, we actually like to um, see each other and have conversations. And unfortunately you can't, you, you can do that virtually. We're doing that right now, but there's just something about being in front of a person that kind of um, um, builds the dynamism between you and other people. Um, so I think the future is like trying to figure out how to navigate um, those connections in this space. And then hopefully in the next couple months, hopefully not too long, <laughs> we'll be on the, on, on, on the more positive side of um, us trying to figure out how to navigate this very weird time. And perhaps the new normal beyond this will be something even better than just doing things virtually. I think we have time to innovate and really think about what the next steps will be. And maybe that's something, that's another conversation that um, Nayama has in the future. Like, how are we going to like, <laughs> you know, how, how are we going, what's the new normal going to look like? How are, how are we like, because vir virtual can't be the only thing, right? Like, what else can we do to preserve um, this space that is very tactile? Like, this is a very tactile endeavor. Like, we have to be in, in front of it, in conversation with it. Um, so how do we do that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. Um, it's, I mean, for us, online has always been really important because we have a space in an obscure place. So mm -hmm. we've always had um, a strong online presence where we you know we would um, engage with clients and people, uh, for website, Instagram, Art Logic, the, everything. Um, but I think we just did a fair um, that was like 100% online. We just did freeze. Uh, first time, actually, a sub-Saharan African gallery to have ever, you know, been accepted to freeze, by the way, apart from South Africa. And we were really excited to do it, but, you know, it became a, a virtual fair. And, I mean, we had to pull out all the tools. You know, we had to have videos of the work. We had to have, you know... Um, conversations with the artists on video, um, 3D of the work, everything we did, we had all the tools and actually it really helped us really uh, refine um, our strategy for online. But even then it was extremely difficult to convert sales, you know? Um, when you think on the first day, I think on Freeze, $5 million was sold, but only from like the blue chip galleries because people I think at this point are feeling like they want to buy something that they've seen before or they that they feel that they deem as safe you know even yeah. though even if it's like you know hundreds of thousands more than some of you know the from the younger galleries. so I just think that it's still going to be difficult for younger galleries new artists to really um convert sales on in this space but I have to say that we had so many more conversations we spoke to people from literally all corners of the world. And so there are pros and cons to it, but I just feel like it's here to stay. And whether we open up a gallery space uh, in London in a couple of weeks or a couple, even in, the, in you know, whatever, it could be six months, who knows? Um, and if I think those tools and kind of this engagement with online, I think is here to stay, but I think that it will complement the physical space because i think a lot of people just said i love it it looks amazing i'm almost convinced but ah, i just i want to see it i want to be in its presence and and that's fair because it's i think art is in a way a very emotional thing people buy with their heart so much more than they do with their anything else so it's it's i think it's here to stay but i i think the new normal is going to be really in, enhanced um tech but with the with the physical kind of alongside it i don't i don't see it just being online I, i'm afraid no at least not for 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 young galleries like ours or uh, emerging artists you know yeah. i think anybody can sell a picasso honestly you can sell that even without seeing it or whatever but it's just you know for for, for things that are up and coming it's going to be harder to just do it online i think yeah I think if I may, that it's important to note that a lot of those free sales were definitely like existing clients for those guys. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, it's like really critically important, actually, in terms of <laughs> thinking about 
like, wait, so how are we able to like make this a sustainable thing? And it really yeah. um, is on freeze to really um, think about how they're actually going to service everyone. Because as you said, not everybody is a blue chip gallery that participates in the fair. Um, mm. So that that's a significant issue. I mean, you know, they, they gave the platform out for free yeah. this time. But, it, you know, it's kind of like, in a way, they had to because of just yeah. the... Yeah. They had to. Um, it's interesting. I had, I had another fair contact us and said, yeah, you want to come on board? We're just going to do an online fair, but, you know, you have to pay for it. And I was like, but it's it hasn't... I don't know whether it's going to work. You know, we can't pay for it up front. And I think it's... there's For the fairs, there's just, there has to be um, a transition phase into... The, I, don't, I think these tools are here to stay and I think any fair that really wants to kind of go into the future has to have a platform of, of, of some sort to complement the physical fair I think it just we just won't go backwards mm -hmm. um, yeah. but I think it's a I think it's really difficult time for everybody and I think the fairs particularly I don't know how you feel yeah. Michaela it's it's hard for the fairs now yeah I mean I think I spent the first couple couple months of this year just like like scratching my head like oh my god what's gonna happen yeah. um and uh I, I sort of just decided i would just pivot in the digital direction um yeah and just kind of like figure it out as i go and uh, i'm sure that's what a number of the fairs are doing they're just kind of iterating and seeing how their audiences respond mm -hmm. i also like to see i mean because a couple of people have asked about um <clears throat> money fundraising like how you know everything can come together especially now that the interactions and the sales opportunities have decreased i think i, I feel like we're at a good time where we can kind of use media and digital platforms to to help do that um if you think about you know just if you're watching a show a streaming kind of service with all these lifestyle shows and people with home design and cooking and food or whatever i feel like there's a real opportunity to kind of have some integration of like art product in sort of these things that people are tuning in to watch you know you've seen a lot of black artists who've been placed on television shows and movies and you know you're like spotting the work or whatever which helps them you know their brand but you know, if there was, a, I guess, a bigger platform in that way, where it's not like you're just going to every gallery's website and looking at the things, it's maybe there's one place where this stuff lives and it's like a channel or something that people can kind of stream or see art in, in physical spaces, like as you would if you were watching a design show or a movie or something. So I feel like those are ways that I, I think galleries or artists, um, producers could talk about maybe there is some type of a channel maybe there is a hosted program that can kind of show the art and the artists in these spaces um in a way that we can kind of connect to you know with the vibe with the music with the talent um because that's just obviously proven to be a way that our community kind of relates to things and so why not put art in that space so I, i'm hoping to see more of that um and then just working with the media. I feel like somebody asked about being a writer. Um, <clears throat> the only reason I started writing and pitching stories and stuff was because I had to. Like nobody was coming to me being like, oh, can I do a review of your show? Or can I interview this artist? Nobody was doing that. And even every time I would pitch to, to publications and, and media outlets, it's, oh, well, they don't have enough followers or they're not, I've never heard of them. We don't know, uh, you know? And so I'm like, I shouldn't have to convince you that this person needs to be written about because half the artists I've read in art form or whatever I've never heard of them either so I don't think <laughs> I don't think that it's my job you know to inform the world that's the whole point of writing about people and and showing places but because of, if you don't have that relationship with the media if you don't have that um connection it's not gonna it's not gonna go anywhere so you have to almost be tag teaming every single area and or we have to have the, our own media which is what we talked about last weekend um mm -hmm. so it's all part of a huge overhaul that needs to be done um and then the money and the connections will come but mm -hmm. that we have to be willing to invest out of our own pockets or get, get some bank 
<laughs> so very loud person driving by i'm sorry <laughs> but, yeah. can I ask a question for you actually um i i heard about this platform that mm -hmm. la galleries have kind of created and i was really inspired by that because yeah. that's such a incredible you know to have like all levels of gallery on yeah. one platform that would really work on an online thing because then as you say people don't have to go to every single website they see it all in one place yeah yeah is that something you're part of or is yeah it, i am i was asked to be a part of it I, I, you know there's one that's developing for new york too so i mean there's a buy-in you know your galleries have to pay and be part of it and and share some of the costs but it's it's affordable it's reasonable and if you know that's something that I think could probably be expanded internationally too. There should be another division of that. So, you know, I can put you in touch with those people too, because there should maybe be like an international component of it um, to bring all of it together. Yeah. Really. Miami has a version of that too. Um, every month they have this thing called Progressive Brunch and all of the galleries in the Miami area basically are open. Um, and you can go to, it's almost like you jump from one gallery to the next and each gallery has like food and brunch available to you. Um, but I, I would say, I think about 15 galleries that are Miami based are, are in that, that little grouping. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, so in keeping with the question or the comment that you just raised regarding how are we using media influence, we have a question from Jennifer Oladipo. She said, hi, all. Thanks for the sh for the sh for all the sharing. I can't read today. I'm sorry. I just need a second. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna start again. Hi, all. Thanks for all the sharing. Could you talk a bit about your relationship with media and promoting your work and your artists? What differences, if any, do you experience between mainstream media? Have you done interesting partnerships? What's the real value they bring for you? Asking as a writer, moving into arts writing and publishing and connecting arts advocates, enthusiasts, and buyers. Thank you for that, Jennifer. And thank you also, Roberta, for your great question as well. Ladies, what have you? I, I'm sorry, I missed the first part of the question. I, I, okay. I yeah. uh, oops. Uh, could you talk a bit about your relationship with media and promoting your work and your artists? What differences, if any, do you experience between mainstream media? I guess, do you mean, you can tell me in the chat, um, Jennifer, do you mean what differences have you experienced between mainstream media and like more focused media on black art, black diaspora art? Is that what you mean in that question? Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. What you got? <laughs> so, I mean, we never, uh, could ever afford a PR person or a publicist or anything like that. So we had to do everything literally from scratch. And, um, and I, you know, of course the first couple of years, it was really difficult to get anything, any, anything at all written about us or our artists. Um, even, even though there was still, there was a hype uh, around Africa and like, you know, we were, um, we were one of the, very few galleries that were actually based on the continent, it was still really difficult to get kind of mainstream uh, articles and so on. However, I think that for us, it's helped us that we had this, we, we, were, uni we were a unique proposition anyway. And we did some really crazy things, if I'm honest with you. Like we opened, for example, we opened our gallery in January of 2016, and then we were at the Armory Show, like, six weeks later in March of that same year. So that kind of commercially was, you know, at the time sounded crazy, but actually that was how we advertised. Like we were like, okay, guys, we're here, you know, we're here and we're serious and it kind of put us on the map. So we just, we've done kind of things like that, that just seemed a little bit left field. And it, it took a couple of years, but you know, since 2018, people have taken note and we've had, coverage in uh, the FT, the art newspaper. Um, for example, like our very first art newspaper article, we did something again, commercially really uh, crazy in that we took a very expensive piece, like a quarter of a million dollars worth one painting to Art Dubai. We knew we were never gonna sell it, but it was a gigantic museum quality piece. 
and we put it in our in our booth um, and we got the centerfold of the art newspaper. So we've done things like that just to kind of engage the writers, engage the, um, the media in that way, just because these were, we, we did kind of commercially crazy, but kind of newsworthy things to, to just create the relationship. And I think once you have the relationship and, and I feel like we have a really good story and we, we come, we've come at it with really an authentic story um, that it's been easier to get, to get, um, to get coverage since then. And then of course that means our artists are getting coverage and our story is getting more, um, you know, it just kind of, it has a snowball effect, doesn't it? So as soon as you get like a FT article, somebody also wants to, you know, New York Times also wants to get, get a, you know, it just kind of snowballs. And in a way we've just used tactics like that to just put ourselves, to just create space for ourselves really, because. I, I don't think anybody was ever going to just say to us, yeah, you know, what are you about? We really just have to do crazy things to just be, um, to make people take note, really. So, yeah. I mean, that's all the more reason to have the database too, because if let's say we all have events happening and we know it's important to sort of have representation among black writers and publications, you know, you immediately put out the call like, hey, we're about to do this thing. If anybody, if any writers want to have first stab at this or pitch it or whatever before or if anybody else doesn't even pick us up, you know, it's there because there's been shows that I've heard about way after the fact that I would have, you know, wanted to go to or cover or whatever. So it's, I think, due diligence on both ends. You know, if writers are out there hungry to get their their beat and to do whatever and specifically want to write about black arts, then they need to know who all of us are and who all of the artists are and, and be right there at the ready to, to take a story on or to do something and to pitch it. Um, especially if you have first access or something, you know, you probably could get a magazine spot. Um, in the same way with us, if we're doing events and programs and stuff, you know, instead of just like holding our breath, waiting for some of these bigger publications to come through, then we should at least hit up all of the, the ones that are, you know, connected to some of the schools or the AUC or any other entities that are going to feed right into our target community and collector base. So, you know, and that could be if you know people like at Essence Magazine or at, at different networks or other things, that's start there mm -hmm. and then you can kind of build because mainstream media may not even be what you, the best thing for me, you know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because if my other people aren't even reading that, then it doesn't help. So I, I need to meet people where they are. Um, and if that's like the local black newspaper, then I should probably make sure to have everything covered there. So um, and if you're a writer that's starting out, maybe you should start there before you get your vogue spread or something, you know, mm -hmm. start with the local community paper that everyone sees when they're walking out of the bodega or whatever. It's just, start there. Um, I'm, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, just, just one thing. Also, I think maybe this will have to be one of the last questions because it's almost 2.30 and I don't want to take up much more of your time, ladies. Again, thank you for being here. But I think one of the questions, Jennifer, that I ask myself whether that's like from a perspective of being a curator, from a perspective of being a writer. Um, I'm also the director of curatorial study, curatorial studies, curatorial affairs. Am I speaking something into existence? Maybe I did, um, but uh, who is it for? And just going back to what Dominique was just saying, like if you can't identify that, I think, you know, that's the thing that's at the heart of whatever your engagement with press is gonna be. If you don't know that, then, you know, you may not be able to answer. Go ahead, um, Mikhail. Um, yeah, so, I mean, it, it essentially was a similar experience for me in that I literally was just like going onto websites and finding who the writers were. And I put together like a database, like in a very like manual sort of fashion um, initially. And then like two years, and then we, like we worked almost every single year with platforms like OK Africa and um, and Sugar King Magazine. And like, that's like, like for me, that's like a mandate. Like before anybody else, I need to be talking to our communities. Um, 
And then, you know, like recently we've gotten like support from the Forbes and your Financial Times and your hyper allergics and those guys. But for me, like the, like at the very base level, at the, as the foundation, like I need to make sure that our content is being um, consumed and supported by um, black communities. Um, so, okay, Af Africa big ups because they do, they do a fantastic job, but mad big oh, ups, <laughs> mad big ups and um, uh, contemporary and which is a, yes. like, I love yeah. that. I love that platform. It's amazing. Um, um, and I'm, I know there's one I'm missing. Black art in um, America. Black art in America. No, totally. Black, black art in America with, with Naji. Um, uh, there was one that I used to work with that was Orlando based called Flavor. Hmm. And um, I don't know that, I don't know that they're still publishing anymore, but um, in essence used to put out a, a My, Miami Art Week guide of black things to do in Miami and they were um, kind enough to include us on that. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think our priority should be making sure our, our, our folks see the, the content and then of course, everybody else can 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 enjoy it as well. Brilliant. Um, I hope that that was a helpful answer or a helpful series of answers. Mm -hmm. um, okay, last one. Okay, this is tough because there's still six questions here. Um, <laughs> hmm. I really like that question, Zoe. Let me see what you got. What's the last bit here? Mm, yeah, I'm going to go with Zoe's question. Sorry, everybody else. <laughs> um, what are the ways you need support? And how have you, what? How and how have you and have you been able to receive support for your galleries and initiatives? What's that experience been like? Mm. And I think, um, you know, again, for those who maybe joined after I began, um, the point of this space, the point of 4-4 is for us to like look after each other to a some mm -hmm. certain degree, which is why I think this is actually a great way to end this. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what, what do you need? Mm -hmm. And how can we help you get it? Um, I would say um, just like definite participation from our communities, like, like at, at the foundational level is just making sure that like if we send you our, our content if you're on our newsletter whether that be you sharing it with your with your databases once you get it um and and then then showing up to it um like go to the fairs that Rakeb is participating in um and support her gallery go to Dominique's gallery come to PRISM um you know I think at the very base level actually participating is a massive thing um and then you know like our our fair is different um we almost function like a i wouldn't say we're like a nonprofit, but we actually don't get like major investment we don't necessarily like have like a huge sponsor and we do a lot of um fundraising um and and grant writing to make sure that our initiative um is sustainable so um i think that for us specifically, we're always looking for, you know, ways that the community can support us even financially um, to make sure that we're able to continue doing our programming. Um, so, I mean, for us, that's important and, um, and sharing. So those are the two like important things for us. Uh, yeah, I would agree. I, I think just, yeah, sharing the content, supporting, um, but even referring, like I was saying before, you know, if there's an artist that you're working with or somebody else that maybe you're, you're, they're not ready or something else, you know, like pass them along to somebody else. You know, like if I don't have the bandwidth to do something or whatever, I'm always thinking, okay, well, how else can I help them? Maybe they should do this residency. Maybe they should try this workshop or try this other gallery. That might be a better fit. Um, you know, so even... For people to do that to me would, is good too because it, it gives me a new artist or a new opportunity to look at without me having to do all the legwork so um i'm always about sharing talent and resources um because you know maybe what i my insight on something might be different or if people are coming to la and 
looking for things to do or or an artist is trying to have some experience or some opportunity, send them my way, you know, because there might be something that comes out of that. And I would do the same for, for you as well. If someone's going to Miami or, you know, like tell them about the fair, tell them about your gallery. You know, if people are making all these African trips and whatnot and going to the continent, like make sure you stop here or do this or support that. So I think, you know, the sharing, and cultivating and obviously the biggest thing is if you have disposable income or if you can work out a system for paying for art that you connect to always do that because you're supporting the artist and you're supporting our business and you're supporting the movement so buy the work tell people about it and and build a relationship with artists uh, and galleries so that you can continue to be a customer and i mean and it's the economics are not that prohibitive. Like you could figure out, you know, we figure out ways to pay for all these other things that we want in our life. Um, art is, is important and don't be turned away by the idea that you can't afford things or you're just not at that level. You know, we're, we're all at different levels and we buy stuff every day. So that's the main thing. Exactly. I mean, I, I would concur with everything that, um, Dominique has just said, I think um, this kind of, we need to be each other's cheerleaders. And I think uh, for, for me, the, the colleagues that I, um, that I consider in East Africa, they're really important to me, even though in essence we're competitors because we, we're underrepresented like in any, any place. So we, we do refer to each other as colleagues because that's what actually we are. We don't, we don't have an ecosystem outside of each other. So I think, just having a wider group of people that can that I consider colleagues that I can I know they're going to be my cheerleaders whatever all of that is really important and I think just as Dominique as you were saying if you have disposable income um the bi biggest way that you can support art and you know young galleries is to just buy and you know with younger galleries we're so flexible we you know we give um, many you, there are ways to kind of work out affordabilities so and also we also have art that that is very very affordable you know a thousand dollars for a, a Gemma Berta print or you know it's we start at that level um, and so a lot of people do get turned off thinking oh art is a luxury item I'm not gonna be able to afford it but actually you 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 might be able to afford an amazing piece of artwork that you'll cherish for the rest of your life for very so you know, ask the questions, get to know the smaller galleries um, and just be part of the cultural production because without the, without people buying the art, uh, kind of things grind to a halt. So you are, as a collector, as somebody that puts money into art, into culture, you are actually a really important part of this whole process. So we might be here setting up our businesses and supporting the artists, but without you, we can't do our jobs. So I think that's, I think that's a, a big thing that I would like to say. And I mean, we have to do a lot of that kind of education here in Ethiopia because people feel like, oh, you know, I can't afford it or it's, you know, it's too. So we, we do real one-to-one -one education with some of our clients um, or would-be clients so that they feel comfortable to just walk in and to say, yeah, how much is this? What, you know, we, we, we do all of that and, and it's, and that has to happen throughout, you know, everywhere it has to happen. The U.S. has to happen. In Europe, people um, need to feel like they can purchase the things that resonate with them. And um, yeah, I think, I think I'd leave it at that. <laughs> oh, you're all on mute. Yeah, I got it. <laughs> um, so... <laughs> uh i there's one last thing helena this is great but yeah. oh hi helena it's too <laughs> good. um so i appreciate each of you so much for being here and really sharing so much of uh not just insight but just your heart for your work and your heart for you know the future and, and legacies that you're building so thank you all. And again, thank you everyone who stuck yeah. with us, hung in there for this two and a half hour, or two and a half, what is happening in my brain today? One and a half, one and a half hour for these 90 minutes. Thank you. Yeah. Um, also, I'm gonna just say this because it's intentional. Every week, 
when we do this, I have on something that you can see that was made by black designers. This is also very important. The same thing that Raku was just saying. It, it matters. Where you spend your money matters. Yeah. Um, this hat is by Essentials. They're a uh, company that's based in uh, Harlem. You can look them up. Dope, 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 dope hats. This ring mm -hmm. is by Rework Creative. She's based in Connecticut. You can look her up. These earrings are by Rebel Chic. Um, she's based here in New York. These are actually um, upcycled leather. So, you know, cool. please think about where you're spending your money. Think about where you can spend your money. Um, everything is within your reach if you want that. So mm -hmm. I'm gonna leave you all with that. Um, thank you again, everybody. Have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. Good night in your future. <laughs> <laughs> and have a good day because the whole day is ahead of you still, Dominique. So thank you again. Yeah. Yeah, no, All right. Talk with us. Thanks, everybody. Have a great week. See you thank next you. week. Thank Bye. you. Bye.